the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints by the river that flows by the throne of God. Soon we'll reach the shining river. Soon our pilgrimage will cease. Soon our happy hearts will quiver with the melody of peace. Yes, we'll gather by the The beautiful, the beautiful river Gather with the saints by the river That flows by the throne of God That flows by the throne of God Amen. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for worship this morning on this Reformation Sunday. Um, I have a couple of announcements, really briefly. Just want to thank you all again for continuing to wear masks and practice social distancing between households as we continue to work to keep one another safe. Today is our trunk or treat following worship. Um, so hopefully you're planning to stay and have some fun for the holiday. Um, if you forgot but would like to stay or didn't know and would like to stay and participate, I have extra treats if you want to be a trunk that participates. So after worship, we'll have um, the kids be able to go trunk or treating from car to car in the back parking lot and we'll have a few other games as well. Um, if you're not staying, of course, just be mindful as you exit the parking lot with your eyes open for those trunk or treaters. Um, for our adult education for the month of November, we're gonna do a book club meeting on this book, Lies My Preacher Told Me. Um, it's an honest look at the Old Testament. We're gonna meet the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, and that actual date escapes me at the moment, but it's two days before Thanksgiving at either 11 in the morning in the fellowship hall or 6.30 in the evening in the fellowship hall. These books are available from the church office for $15. If you want to take one home with you today, see me after worship, and I'll make sure you get your book, even if you need to pay later. Um, it's 108 pages, so you can read this before Thanksgiving, but you don't have to. You can... You can join us for the discussion even if you don't have a chance to read the book. I think those are all of my announcements. Are there other announcements or prayer requests this morning? Dolores. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dolores. And it, it's wrong in the bulletin today, but we'll have it corrected for next week. Dolores has a new email address. She has cards, um, so you can see her after worship to get that updated email address from her. Um, if you are on the prayer chain, you will continue to receive those emails. You just need her new address, so you can get a card from her, and we will get it updated in the bulletin for next week. Um, any other announcements or prayer requests this morning? All right. I do want to remind you all that it's not too late to donate. Um, towards our goal of raising $500 for the Crop Hunger Walk, and you can use the QR code on the back of your bulletin if you haven't had a chance to do so yet. Um, let's simply pause this morning for a moment of silence before we enter into our time of worship. Let's pause. Amen. Friends, today is Reformation Sunday. That's why we have the red pyramids, and I'm wearing my red stole. Um, red is a color that we use when we are particularly celebrating the work of the Holy Spirit, and certainly Reformation Sunday is a celebration of that work. On Reformation Sunday, we celebrate how the church has grown and changed as it seeks to be Christ's body on earth. This service celebrates the legacy of our ancestors in the faith and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit by taking a journey through our denomination's book of confessions. The confessions are statements of faith, statements that seek to make some kind of coherent summary of what Christianity calls us to say and do in a particular time and place. Throughout the service, you will hear and participate in reading excerpts from all of our confessions except our most familiar one, the Apostles' Creed. When we come to the bolded parts of the excerpts printed in your bulletin, you're invited to re read along with the liturgists. These confessions are part of our constitution as Presbyterians, meaning they guide and shape our life together. Pastors and elders, and deacons vow to be guided by them. They are not scripture, and we do not believe or follow every word they say, but they do witness to the history of the church and to the faith of our ancestors. May we have open ears to hear God's voice in the voices of our ancestors. May we have open minds to understand what they experienced and believe. May we have open hearts to accept what God might be saying to us today. May our holy God guide us into writing new chapters for the future. Come, let us worship God. Our first hymn this morning is Of the Father's Love Begotten, and it comes from a fourth century poem and has been treasured by the church for over 1,500 years. Let's stand and sing together the first, second, and last verses of hymn number 108.
The story of Reformation is the story of our sovereign God, who is always at the work in the world, always refining the church to be more Christ-like. Listen for God's word from Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3 and 10. God is our refuge and strength, a very ready help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth shakes and the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. Through its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, Selah, cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. Holy wisdom, holy word. It was 381 AD. The Emperor Constantine had declared Christianity to the one true unified religion of the Roman Empire, but found that Christianity was anything but unified. He had already convened one council to try to bring some order to this unruly young religion, but Christians with different perspectives on the divinity of Jesus continued to fight it out, sometimes with their pens and sometimes with their fists. And also, in 381, another council came together and adopted the Nietzschean Creed, which shares much language with the Apostles' Creed and is used by Christians in diverse traditions across the world. Using the printed words in your bulletin, let us responsively proclaim what our ancestors have so long believed beginning in unison. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty Maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and Catholic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. For nearly 1,500 years, the Catholic Church grew and spread across the globe, and while it underwent change and transformation, it managed to mostly hang together until the Protestant Reformation. On October 31st, 1517, 504 years ago today, priest the Theologian 
and monk Martin Luther nailed 97 complaints to a church door in Wittenberg, sparking a debate and controversy that would eventually lead to a new and even more diverse way of being the church. It was not an easy time, the reformers, and the reformers were not always the heroes. We would have them to we'd have them to be. Remembering that we are as well as our ancestors are fallible and imperfect. Let's stop now and confess our sins together, asking God for mercy and pardon until prayers using prayer printed in your bulletin. Holy gracious God, we confess today to the same sins that have always plagued your church. We are too stuck in our ways to to resist your spirit, to attract power and privilege, to quick to build walls, to slow to build bridges, send more reformation our way until we are formed perfectly by you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Sin has always been at work in the world and God's grace has been at work even longer than sin. We believe that when the story is over, it is forgiveness that will have the last word. In Christ, we are forgiven, now and as often as we come before the throne of grace and mercy. Alleluia. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Let us show signs of peace. You may be seated. The Scots Confession was written in Scotland, of course, in 1560, in just four days, by six men who were all named John. In a time of political turbulence, it declares God's everlasting power over the Kirk, the Church, and indeed, the whole world. Ancestors proclaimed, as we believe in one God, Father and Son and Holy Ghost, so we firmly believe that from the beginning there has been, now is, and to the end of the world shall be, one Kirk, that is to say, one company and multitude of people chosen by God, who rightly worship and embrace him by true faith in Christ Jesus, who is the only head of the Kirk, even as it is the body and spouse of Christ Jesus. This Kirk is Catholic, that is, universal, because it contains the chosen of all ages, of all realms, nations, and tongues, be they of the Jews or be they of the Gentiles, who have communion and society with God the Father and with his Son, Christ Jesus through the sanctification of his Holy Spirit. It is therefore called the communion, not of profane persons, but of saints, who as citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem have the fruit of an estimable purpose, one God, one Lord Jesus, one faith, and one baptism. As we continue to consider the Reformation Confessions, we turn to a hymn Martin Luther himself wrote. Let's listen to the first verse sung by Nicholas, then rise and sing together the remaining verses of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Fortress is 
In mainland Europe, Lutherans and Reformed Christians were fighting over communion, and so the theologians from each camp sat down together in Germany to create a statement they could all agree with, to find words of unity and peace, and to remember that despite fateful disagreements, 
they ultimately all belong to Christ. They wrote their confessions as a catechism, a series of questions, <laughs> a series of questions. These questions invite us to proclaim for ourselves the trust we have in Christ. Join me in the bolded words printed in your bulletin. What is our only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of evil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall off from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation, because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Our final Reformation confession was written by a Swiss pastor in 1561 designed as a practical guide for his congregation. Its name comes from the Latin word for Swiss, Helvetia. It emphasizes the Reformation conviction that faith is not a result of human insight or action, but a pure gift from God. Join me in the bold words. Christian faith is not an opinion or human conviction, but a most firm trust and a clear and steadfast assent of the mind and then a most certain apprehension of the truth of God presented in the scriptures and in the apostle creeds, and thus also of God himself, the greatest good, and especially of God's promise, and of Christ who is the fulfillment of all promises. But this faith is a pure gift of God, which God alone of his grace gives to his elect, according to his measure, when, to whom, and to the degree of his wills. And he does this by the Holy Spirit, by means of preaching of the gospel and steadfast prayer. Today is our first Sunday of stewardship season. And as we consider the history of the church, may we also consider the future of this church. I invite all of us to open our hearts and minds to how we are being called to bring glory to God to reflect Christ to every one of our neighbors? Is God calling us to serve in new ways, to give in new ways? As you prayerfully consider how God is moving you to give of your time, talent, and resources, I ask, and the session asks, as an indicator of your prayerful consideration, that you would pledge to give something for the upcoming budget year. It can be a dollar or less, your pledge. The amount is not what matters. What matters is our unity. Just as the confession and catechism writers throughout history paused to put pen to paper and confess what they believed, our pledges, which help us create the church budget, are also a confession of faith in God's provision and God's call. We are unified in our calling as the church, and 100% of giving units pledging would be such an encouragement an indicator of God's call to us, and a reflection of our strength and unity. Together we are the body of Christ. We are each unique and necessary, and God is most clearly seen and experienced when we come together. We need one another, and our greater community needs us to be unified in purpose and love in order to see how Christ is reflected here at Willow Creek. Um, pledge sheets will be available on the table on the landing for you to take home today. They're gold. Um, Brenda's holding them up now. Thank you, Brenda. So they'll be down there on the landing where you picked up your bulletin on the way in. Um, you can take it home today and pray over it. It will also be available in your streamer email and in the updates emails the next couple of weeks. Next Sunday, we'll have another moment for stewardship. And we're asking you to bring your pledge sheets back um, the Sunday after that, November 14th. Ed Rotman will be preaching that day for the close of our stewardship season, and we'll have ushers who will collect the stewardship, um, stewardship pledges along with the offering that Sunday. Now, let's listen, wonder, and pray how God is moving us to give today and tomorrow. If we 
Holy Eternal One, remembering that you have always been at work in the world, we give these gifts, trusting your sovereignty, so that you work of grace, your work of grace may not only continue, but continue through us. Amen. Let's sing together hymn number 321, but just the first and last verses of the Church's One Foundation, written
Please be seated. A generation after the Reform Reformation, a group of English the theologians created the West My Westminster Confession over the course of more than a thousand meetings in the 1640s. They also produced two catechisms, one for preachers by a professor of divinity, the other for children by a professor of mathematics. The following questions were for the children to memorize. Me in the bolded words, what is the chief and highest end of humanity? Humanity's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy him forever. What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. What is adoption? Adoption is an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all privileges of God, children of God. What is sanctification? Sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole person after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. What are the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? Assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost, increase of grace, and perseverance therein to Trusting in that love, that peace, that joy and grace, let us now join our hearts in prayer. God of grace and God of glory, you have poured your power on your people. We pray now in your holy name, knowing that you care for great and small. We pray for creation with joy for the changing of the seasons, the beauty of the leaves and cooler days. We pray for your mercy on those who battle the forces of nature, for victims of hurricanes and earthquakes, for those who cannot access clean water or find shelter from the elements. We pray for the nations, ours included. We pray for leaders and those in power that they may use that power on behalf of the powerless and listen for the wisdom of your guidance. We pray today for the church in all its forms, Mega churches and house churches, congregations gathered in historic cathedrals and in strip mall storefronts. For the church on every continent, for Christians of every denomination and tradition, for the deeply committed and those on the brink of faith. We pray that in our diversity, all might find a home that fits them and that we might remember our ultimate unity in you, a unity born of your love and works towards reconciliation, towards becoming your one church in the world, your one body here on earth. We pray for those who struggle today because of illness or grief or lack of opportunity, lack of resources, oppression, hopelessness, or helplessness. We pray that you would show us what spiritual gifts we might offer each one, that we might be mutually encouraged, healing for the sick, comfort for the grieving, love for the lonely, and support for the downtrodden, food for the hungry, and faith for the lost. By your grace, soothe suffering and bring renewal in tired lives. Seeking that renewal, seeking reformation, we join our hearts and voices with Christians in every time and place and pray as Jesus taught us, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Here's our second Latin lesson of the day. 
Ecclesia Reformada, Semper Reformanda, is something of a motto from the Reformed Church and is often translated as reformed and always reforming. But a more accurate translation is reformed and always being reformed, reminding us that reformation is God's work, not ours. And God is always at work, reforming, sanctifying, growing us as individuals and the church, changing us into an even more clarified likeness of Christ. As we move to the modern confessions that wrestle with the changing world, let's sing hymn number 20, 288, Spirit of the Living God, written by Presbyterian pastor in Tarboro, North Carolina in 1935. It was 1934, and the Nazi party was on the rise in Germany, initiating a ring of cruelty, hate, and terror. Many German Christians found no problem with Hitler's actions, declaring that their faith and their patriotism went hand in hand. A few Christians, however, resisted. Representatives from the Reformed Lutheran and United Churches gathered to create a confession of faith to send to their fellow German Christians urging them to display the freedom in Christ by standing firm against Hitler. We confess the eternal truth that the church was not meant to be co-opted by worldly forces, but clings only to Christ. Confess with me. The Christian church is the congregation of the people in which Jesus Christ acts presently as the Lord in word and sacrament through the Holy Spirit. As the church of pardoned sinners, it has to testify in the midst of a sinful world, with its faith as with its obedience, with its message as with its order, that is solely his property, and that it lives and wants to live solely from his comfort and from his direction and the expectation of his appearance. We reject the false doctrine as though the church were permitted to abandon the form of its message and order to its own pleasure or to changes in privileging prevailing ideological and political convictions. The 1960s turned America upside down. In the midst of cultural tensions and conflicts, the Northern Presbyterian Church adopted a new confession based around the idea that in Christ, the whole world is reconciled to God. Let's confess together. God's redeeming work in Jesus Christ embraces the whole of humanity's life, social and cultural, economic and political, scientific and techno technological, individual and corporate. It includes humanity's natural environment as exploited and despoiled by sin. It is the will of God that is purpose for human life shall be fulfilled under the rule of Christ, and all evil be banished from his creation. Biblical visions and images of the rule of Christ, such as a heavenly city, a father's house, a new, a new heaven and earth, a marriage feast, an unending day culminate. In the image of the kingdom, the kingdom represents the triumph of God over all that resists his will and disrupts his creation. Already God, God's reign is present 
as a ferment in the world, stirring hope in people and preparing the world to receive its ultimate judgment and redemption. With an urgency born of this hope, the church applies itself to present tasks and strives for a better world. It does not identify limited progress with the kingdom of God on earth, nor does it despair in the face of disappointment and defeat. In steadfast hope, the church looks beyond all partial achievement to the final triumph of God. In 1986, apartheid, the separation and treatment of people based on race, raged in South America, South Africa. Some white Christians used scripture to justify this system, and so the Dutch Reformed Church wrote the Belhar Confession in protest, insisting that God's vision for humanity was one of liberation, equality, unity, and communion. Let's confess together these words translated to English from the original Afrikaans. We believe that God has revealed himself as the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. That God in a world full of injustice and enmity is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged. That God calls the church to follow him in this. For God brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry that God frees the prisoner and restores sight to the blind, that God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows, and blocks the path of ungodly, that for God, pure and undefiled religion is to visit the orphans and the widows in their suffering, that God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right, that the church must therefore stand by people in any form of suffering and need, which implies, among other things, that the church must witness against and strive against any form of injustice, so that justice may roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, that the church and the possession of God must stand where the Lord stands, namely against injustice for the wrong that in following Christ, the church must witness against all the powerful, privileged, who selfishly seek their own interests and thus control and harm others. In 1861, the Presbyterian Church in this country split over the issue of slavery. 122 years later, in 1983, the Northern and Southern churches finally reunited, and Presbyterians celebrated that new unity with a new confession. The brief statement of faith reminds us that the church is not meant to be a hiding place from the world, but a blessing to the world. And so, as we go forth to carry on the legacy of our ancestors and to write a new chapter in God's story inspired by the Holy Spirit, Let's rise and read these words as today's charge. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others in peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. As you go forth from this place, go with the love of God who created you, the peace of Christ who saved you, and the Holy Spirit who reforms, renews, and refreshes you today, tomorrow, and evermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.